Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, Clairaut's theorem, which basically tells you that that the mixed partials, so it doesn't depend on the order in which you write the variables under suitable conditions. And these are these are the sufficient conditions for this to hold. It, this result of the equality of mixed partials may hold even if these conditions don't hold. May hold for some other reason, but this just gives you sufficient conditions for the equality to hold. So it says, suppose f is a function defined on an open subset of R. So open, you don't really care what open subset means, but it's sort of like something which which doesn't have any boundary stuff. If you want, you can just assume I'm, I'm saying open disk. Open disk. Uh, I mean, this the picture I have isn't a disk, but you could imagine that you have an open disk like that. I mean, the results are equivalent if you just use the open disk. Okay, so it's an open thing, which means there's no boundary issue. There's no point at the boundary. And the reason why we want to avoid points at the boundary is because if you have a point on the boundary, then you don't really know how to differentiate it along certain directions because they're not on the inside of the of the, of the domain. Okay? Suppose you have that both the both these mixed partials, f sub xy and f sub yx. So f sub xy, you're differentiating first with respect to and then y, and f sub y, so if you first just the y and then x. Suppose both these mixed partials exist and are continuous functions on u. Well, I have a, I, I haven't, I'm not defining continuous in this video, it's, it's in, it will be in some other videos, what it means for a function of two variables to be continuous. But that, that's a separate issue. So let's assume that both these functions are continuous for suitable meaning of the word continuous and for the usual meaning. Then the claim is that both these f sub x y and f sub y x, they'll, they'll both be equal to each other on u. That's what Clairaut's theorem says. So that's that's the statement. Okay. Now, what's the intuition as to why this is true? So It's kind of, I mean, one way you could do is you could actually write out the expressions limits and do the double limits. What will happen is that both of these will come out as some kind of a double limit. That will be a, because of each time you differentiate, you get a limit. So you'll have something like limit of a limit. And so one limit will be as your x is approaching x naught, the other limit will be as y is approaching y naught. Okay, so you would you lose the limit and you have something. And and the and the actual expression in here would be the same for fxy and fy. But in one year you'll have your x limit on the inside, and in one you'll have your y limit on the inside. That's sort of the rough idea what will happen when you work this out. And the expressions would turn out to be the same. And the key thing is whether you can switch around these two limits. Okay. And if your if your functions if your partials are continuous, then then that then that whole limit thing can be switched around. So there's a bunch of of results and ideas why when you can switch around the limits. But you see, the expression you are limiting is the same. The question is whether it matters the order in which you take the limits. And and that's what is is. Uh, that, that's what the continuity assumption tells us. Now I want to say a little bit more about this theorem, not so much the proof angle. Uh, and, and by the way, if you, if you want to understand so why this is the conceptually what these mean and all, you can look at the video on, on labor and capital and the production functions and you'll see more about the, what the intuition behind these is. I doesn't quite explain why they're equal, but it, it will say intuition what they mean. Okay, so, so what this will tell you, a corollary will be that assuming the continuity things, assuming suitable continuity, the order of differentiation doesn't matter even for functions of many variables and higher. Matter. And there's two sort of directions we can generalize. Functions of more than one variable, more than two variables, okay. So the original statement here is two variables, but but the but it, it also tells you things about function more than and higher order derivatives. I'll just, I'll just take some examples after after here after I write here. Okay, 
So it's going to tell you that under suitable continuity assumptions, if you have if you have a function of three variables, then f sub x y y z will be the same as f sub z y x y. Okay, so I'm I'm sort of illustrating both these ideas. I'm taking a higher order derivative. And I'm and I'm doing function of three variables. And the reason why they're the same is the number of occurrences of each variable is the same. Okay. And this is obviously you have to make suitable continuity assumptions. So you actually have to assume that both these uh, that that sort of the you have to make a lot of continuity assumptions. I'm not putting them explicitly, but but if you're working with polynomials and these kinds of nice functions, then those continuity assumptions do apply. Okay. So that's uh, Another way you can sort of get an understanding of, of the why, how this result is true is if you look at some special cases of functions, which are easy to think about. So if I give you a function f of x, y is uh, uh, maybe I'll use capital F x, y is so this this now is not the same as this f because I'm, I'm using capital F for the function little f of x plus little g of y, this is what kind of function is this? Uh, additive separable. Additively separable. And what can you say about the mixed partial f sub, oh, just what, what are f sub x is f prime x, f sub y is g prime y. And you can see that both the mixed partials are zero. Okay, so, so this is a way of verifying that the result holds in this additively separable case, even if you didn't know the theorem in general. Then you can just verify. Uh, another case you can verify quickly is the multiplicatively separable one. This is a new f. It's mm -hmm. not maybe I'll call it g. g of x y. So this is a new function. Mm -hmm. Now what is g sub x of x comma y? Well, you just differentiate with respect x, mm -hmm. keeping y constant says f prime x. G y, uh, g sub y of x comma y is f, f x g prime y. Okay, and now you can see if you do g sub x y. Now f prime x is a constant, so you get f prime x g prime y, and you get you get the same result for g sub y x. Right, because our g prime by the constant. So you see that these two are equal. Okay, so that this is a, oh by the way, for both of these I'm assuming that f and g are are both differentiable functions, otherwise you couldn't take these partials. But this proves the theorem in these special cases without having to do without sort of seeing the full proof.